before I begin the lesson this morning, I want to thank you so much for the kindness and the hospitality. Um, as I said in the first lesson of this meeting, I love you guys so much, and just the opportunity to be here is, is wonderful. And to be invited to speak on these important things is just nice and wonderful. I really have enjoyed preparing these lessons to present to you. And in these lessons, we just scratch the surface. There is so much evidence that's there. It's humbling to study these things. It truly is. God did not leave us without evidence. We have to put one all But thank you so much for everything that you've done for me this week. And thank especially you and Shelley for giving me a place to stay. Putting up with my silliness. And, uh, we're used to, to having these good times together. And, and uh, it's, it's been a, a great, wonderful week spending time with all of you. And uh, next time I shouldn't wait so long. <laughs> but pray for us and, and our family and our work there in, in Camp Stoda. I know you already do that. And we appreciate so much your prayers for Sonia, especially in the past few years as she's been battling cancer. And again, keep praying for her that we can finally be past all of this at some point and then uh, press on forward. In our previous hours, we left with this chart that his mission was to die for human need. Yet, death could not hold him. As Peter says in Acts 2 and verse 22, Men of Israel, hear are these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did to you in the midst of years and talks of Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawlessness, have crucified, and put to death, and it doesn't even matter. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible, not possible, that he should be held by so we're talking about his being loosed from death. We're talking about this morning his resurrection from the dead. Just one question. Did Jesus rise from the dead? And again, we have eyewitness testimony plus circumstantial evidence. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And, and again, just scratching the surface of this most important and most vital topic. We have to understand everything depends on this. The answer to this question. Did Jesus rise? Because if Jesus did not rise, if we say no to that, well, he's still dead. There are some who say that he never died to begin with. We'll answer that in just a minute. Did Jesus rise? Well, if he did not rise, then he's a fraud. Jesus predicted his own resurrection, and he predicted that it would happen on the third day. But that didn't happen at that time. Then he fits the description Deuteronomy 18, as we read previously in the series. That makes him a prophet. We shouldn't be concerned about him or fear him if he's a prophet. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the chapter that deals so much with resurrection, resurrection of Christ, and what that means for us. We don't have time uh, in this lesson to deal with the entire chapter. Just a portion of it. But Paul makes the statement in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he did not raise up. If in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen... Your faith is futile. It's vain. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. So if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have no hope. It's useless. We might as well give up being spiritual. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, if he did indeed come out of the tomb on the third day, what does that mean? It means that he is Lord. He is Lord. Let's look at these two passages. At Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. I'll just read verse 4. 
and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection establishes and proves his lordship that he is the Son of God. Going back to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, once again, the conclusion of the sermon in verse 36. Giving all the evidence, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus to the new future time, both Lord and prophet. So much evidence in that sermon concerning the resurrection that Jesus had not been raised after being crucified, he would not be sitting as Lord at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. Because Jesus rose from the dead, our own resurrection is possible. In Romans chapter 6 and Baptism, immersion in water is a reflective of what happened to Jesus. As Jesus died and was put into the tomb and rose again to walk in new life, that's the same with us. When we die to the old man, we, our sins are, are, are taken to the cross. We are immersed in water and rise to walk in this water. If Jesus didn't rise, baptism is useless, it means nothing. But we can have spiritual resurrection because of Coming out of the tomb. We can have an eternal resurrection according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have a new life beyond this one. So if Jesus rose from the dead, we have hope. There's no middle ground to this. I heard some liberal theologians say, well, a resurrected Christ isn't really necessary. We entertain the idea, but don't really believe in it. It's, it, it's one of the other things. One of the other. You just can't say, all right, we, we believe in a Christ because it's nice to, and we don't have to believe in a resurrection. That, that's not looking at what the Bible has to say about it. So let's look now for the rest of this hour in this last lesson in this series. Did Jesus rise from the dead? What does the evidence say? Everything is based on evidence now. We're looking at the eyewitness testimony of the gospel writer. What about this claim that he didn't really die? Didn't really die. Well, some think that the Romans killed the wrong man. They didn't actually kill Jesus. They killed somebody else. Muslims will say that Jesus was never killed or crucified, that, that God rescued him from that and substituted Jesus Iscariot to die on the cross. Well, does that hold up? Now, what, what does the evidence say? The, well, in the Gospels, the Jews were insistent on killing Jesus. They wanted him dead. They were determined. And, and after trying to, to test him and corner him for three years, you think they'd make the mistake of getting the wrong man? Suddenly get the wrong person? The disciples knew that it was Jesus who died. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And fearful, and they hid because they feared for their own lives. They didn't know if they were next. If it was somebody other than Jesus, don't you think they would say at some point, I'm not him, you got the wrong guy, wait a minute. I'm not Jesus. You think Pilate would have figured that out? He questioned Jesus, sent him to be scourged. Pilate would not. You really think if it was Judas, the Jews would be quiet? You know, the Jews knew Judas Iscariot better than the other disciples, perhaps because Judas had made a deal with them. They knew who he was. Let's turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Verses 26 and 27. Jesus here on the cross. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, reference to the apostle, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, this is Jesus showing compassion for his mother. And having John take care of him. John is going to be a son. 
The point I'm taking from this is here is the mother of Jesus. She knows who Jesus is. Don't you think? Wouldn't the mother know if that was her son on the cross? It was Jesus there. The Jewish, the Roman, and the Christian records are in agreement as to as to who was executed and crucifixion. If you go against that, you defy all of the historical evidence. So this is ridiculous. Romans did not kill the wrong man. Well, this is a popular idea, but this is what the past some try to resurrect the people of the point. That Jesus only swooned on the cross, that he just claimed he didn't really die. He didn't quite die. Well, there's a problem with this. Because Jesus' disciples, who prepared his body and embalmed him and his enemies who killed him, knew that he was dead. Let's go to John chapter 19, now and verse 31. Notice that in the previous verse, in verse 30, Jesus said he was finished. Now that he gave up the spirit. And so the apostle John says he died. Now, verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they would not be taken away. There were two other men hanging on crosses beside Jesus. The body to be then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And notice that, that John pauses to make this statement in verse 35, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you make believe. So he's emphasizing the fact Jesus was dead. I was there. I saw it. Notice what the Roman does to make sure Jesus is dead. A spear into the side. This is an illustration from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And they have a, an article, and they did a, a special article on did Jesus die? And they think Conclusion based upon the evidence from the gospel, he most certainly did. And perhaps you can find this on the internet somewhere in search, but this illustration shows that this is where the spear would have gone into him, and piercing his heart in this way would indeed have ended life if he wasn't dead already. He could not survive this type of, of, of injury. There's no way. And also it spoke of the blood and, and water coming out of the sign, that what Jesus had been through already was put strain and stress upon his heart, the scourging and also the hanging in, in the time period that he does, that, that liquid fluid would have built upon his heart. And so you would expect to see blood and water, water come out. And nobody could survive when that's the case. He was dead. I'm going to die. The Romans were expert executioners. These guys had this job, and they knew whether they were dead or not. And their own life was on the line because they had orders from the government to execute this to do it exactly so. Jesus died on the cross. Let's let's just demonstrate how silly that swoon theory is. To start with just go from the beginning of his suffering. He was a scourge. A blood loss there. He didn't have enough strength to carry his cross. He was on the cross for hours. He had severe thirst. He had fear to the heart. Sealed in a tomb for three days without food and water and of oxygen. No way of escape. At the tomb in June out of solid rock. If Jesus didn't really die, just fainted and they put him in there, he would have to have unwrapped the bandages which were wrapped totally around his limbs and his face, as the disciples had wrapped his body in that way, and wrapped his body with 100 pounds of spices. 
Let's go to Mark. I want you to take my word for it. Let's go to Mark, uh, chapter 15. Mark 15 and uh, the first 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. When he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled the stone against the door of the tomb. We also learn from the Gospel accounts that Nicodemus was there as well, and contributed the hundred pounds of spices. A swooning Jesus would have to remove all of that off of his body after all that happened to him. Remove that heavy boulder out of the way which had been put there in front of the tomb. The tomb was sealed by the Roman soldiers and he would have to have broken that seal, overcome those on guard that were set there, and then walk seven miles to Emmaus as he's seen doing later with pierced feet. And then appear to these people so as to not cause concern. This is a ridiculous theory. It makes no sense whatsoever. And if you're going to defy logic and the testimony of multiple eyewitnesses and say that Jesus didn't die on the cross, then you have to show and demonstrate where he did die and how he did die. And nobody has that information because this is the time of death. The Old Testament prophecies indicated that Jesus would die in this manner in the purest. Jesus predicted the means of his own death as the Son of God, that he would be lifted up, that he would be crucified. He died due to the wounds received before and especially during his time on the cross, the fatal blow, that he wasn't dead already, and he wasn't, because he was dead according to the scripture. If he wasn't dead, the spear would have taken care of it. So the fact that we read about in Scripture shows us that this idea is totally wrong. Yes, he did die. Well, what about the idea that, okay, he died, but he stayed dead, that he didn't run? Well, then, if you're going to say that, how do you account for the numerous resurrection here? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. Paul says in verse 3, For I deliver to you first of all that that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter, by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So, among his resurrection appearances, he appeared to over 500 people at the same time. Paul said, you can go ask them, most of them are still alive. After that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me. So, also, as one born out of the time. How, how do you account for that? If Jesus had stayed dead, well, some people say, well, the, the disciples hallucinated his resurrection. You know, they, they wanted to see it so badly that they all just made themselves see it, made themselves hallucinate. Well, there's a problem with that idea because the disciples didn't even expect Jesus to rise from the dead in the first place. Let's look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. This is earlier after Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. As he came down from the mountain and commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Like this Peter, James, and John were talking. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. You see, they're, they're confused. They don't know what this means. They're just confused about it. They don't say, oh, I see, I see what you're going to do. No, they, they just, 
They, they just question it in their mind. They just don't comprehend it fully. And in Mark chapter 16, Mark 16 and verse 9, after Jesus rose from the dead, says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Or out of whom he cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Mary, we don't believe. We don't believe. Jesus is here. Verse 12, after that he appeared in another form, two of them as they walked and the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Afterward he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Like, hello, I'm here. <laughs> but you see, they didn't expect Jesus to rise. So how could it be possible that they would want to hallucinate something that they didn't think would happen in the first place? As John 20 and verse 9 says, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Well, Luke chapter 24. Twenty-four and verse um, yeah, verse one. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then they were afraid, as they were afraid, and bowed their faces to the earth. They said to them, Why do you seek the living among? There are angels appearing to these women. Jesus isn't here. He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, don't you remember what he said before? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day by the tomb. And they remember his words. They returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with him who told these things to the apostles, and the words seemed to them like idle tell, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the women cloths lying by themselves. But he parted marveling to himself of what had happened. And so we have multiple gospel accounts here showing that the disciples just didn't expect it at all. They weren't prepared for a sudden hearing. Now, about this idea of hallucination. One authority says about this, quote, Now it is perfectly possible for one man to have hallucination. And two men might have the same hallucination by a singular coincidence. But that eleven men of intelligence whose character and writings indicate their sanity, in other respects, or that five hundred men in a body should have seen the same hallucination at the same time, Stretches the law of probability to the breaking point. There is no such thing as group hallucination. And then consider that the appearances of Jesus stop suddenly for everyone. They saw him for 40 days and then no more. You would think if somebody was hallucinating, they, some of them would keep hallucinating after a time. Well, they saw the risen Lord. He left this earth. But if you say that the disciples hallucinated his resurrection, that doesn't account for the empty tomb. This is a very poor explanation. Just doesn't work. Well, what about that? Some say, well, yes, Jesus died and stayed dead because he rose in spirit form only. We're in Luke still. We're in Luke 24. Now, verse 36. Luke 24, 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they'd seen a spirit. All right, this is their first impression. Oh, this, this is the spirit. 
And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. I'm not just a ghost right here. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe for joy and marvel, they're just stunned. <laughs> he said to them, have you any food here? This is fun tonight. So they gave him a piece of raw fish and took it and ate it in his friends. Because ghosts don't eat. He gives them further evidence. It's me in the flesh, people. In John chapter 21, another word for experience, he fixes breakfast for them. A goat can't do that. And he says, me. See the marks? And again, if Jesus wrote the script on the only, it doesn't explain the empty tomb. This is inadequate. This is something that, 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 that I've heard recently. Uh, where people are saying, oh, he, he was never buried. That he was left on the cross to rot and was eaten by vultures and wild dogs. <laughs> well, you see, the body's not going to vanish into thin air. If, if that were the case, you'd have bones and bones left behind. But does anyone really think that as special a person as Jesus was, that absolutely no one would be able to give him peace? But there's no shred of evidence to suggest this idea in the least. And, and the best witnesses of Jesus' burial were enemies. The Jews wanted him down from the cross, as we read earlier, because the Sabbath day, or the Passover, was coming. And the governor, the Roman governor, saw to his burial, as we read, and trusted that duty to Joseph of Arimathea, who went through a lot of trouble preparing the place for the burial of the new place. Preparing the body of Jesus. Jesus wasn't going to be very quick in a lot of trouble. Then why bother with the demon? We mentioned Nicodemus' involvement in the burial. The women verified that his body was placed there in the tomb and they were surprised on the third day to find that tomb empty and the body missing. Roman guards were witnesses because they sealed the tomb. Why would they seal the tomb if the body wasn't inside? So this doesn't make any sense. Well, the disciples just went to the wrong tomb. You know, Jesus is still dead in the tomb, but they got mixed up and they went to one that was open and nothing in there, and they thought that he could. Well, that's kind of hard to do when there are guards sitting in the correct tomb. And there was a garden there. We have two major landmarks. And the tomb was visited by different disciples at different times. Did they all make the same mistake? Did they all, they all look the same wrong tomb? Luke 23, 55. Luke 23, 55, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after him, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. The women knew correctly. Matthew 27, 61. Matthew 27, 61. Let me go backwards a bit there in that day. Verse 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had mewed out of all. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb of the body. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite him. We have the witness of the women. We have the other witnesses, but think about the witness of the women. They know exactly what Jesus took. Jesus' mother 
Do you think she would forget what her son was born? If you just think about Mary Magdalene, do you think she would forget as greatly as she wanted to Jesus and what he had done for her life? Do you think she would forget? Yeah, I, I've been to many funerals where there's been a graveside service. And we know that the body's going to be there. And to go back to that site later after the dirt has been filled. And then even much later when grass is grown in that spot. And let me tell you, people who are close to that person don't have to wander around the graveyard. I don't remember where it was. I know where my grandparents are buried. And I can go right to it. Straight to it. It's a huge cemetery. I know. I know where my dad is there. At the water tank. I can go right to it. I just think it's incredible to think that so many people who love Jesus would just make a huge mistake. I think for me that doesn't make sense. At all. But the same wrong thing. The Roman guards under penalty of death Affirm that the tomb, the correct tomb, was empty. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became black. Dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus. He's not, he's not here. He's risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring the disciples' word. As they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. They came and, you know, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. And again, how could the Roman guards not know which tomb that it was? And as they reported these things to the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin believed that, yes, the correct tomb is indeed empty. Verse 12, when they had assembled with his elders and taken counsel, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and sold them away while he slept. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, as the same is commonly reported from the Jews to his death. If they had gone to the wrong tomb, the Jews would have said, look, you made a big mistake. It's this one and not that one. They understood that Jesus was not there anymore, that he'd been risen from the correct tomb. And they said, we've got to have a cover-up plan right now. We've got to spread this rumor that the disciples took the body. But one neat thing about, about this one small little detail, and Jeremy and I were talking about this earlier in the week, the fact that Jesus' linen cloths were in the tomb. Peter recognized it. It was the right tomb. It was the right tomb. So this explanation is amazing. To say. Well, let's just say uh, and, and go with what the Jews were, were saying. Someone stole his dead body and he didn't, didn't rise from the dead. Why would the Jews do this? That, that's the last thing they wanted. They needed the body to stay in there. They wanted it secure. They asked for the guards in the first place. They had no motive to steal it. The Romans, they had no motive to steal the body either. It makes no sense. The Roman guards shook for fear and were afraid when they saw the, the angels. We saw that. The disciples, would they steal the body? No, they were behaving like scared animals. They'd scattered and gone into hiding. They were powerless to steal the body. The Roman guards were there. The Roman guards told the tale that, oh, when we were asleep, the disciples stole the body. Well, if they were asleep, how would they know who stole the body? Whatsoever. And if somebody stole stole the, the, the dead body, why would they take the time to unwrap the body 
and fold the burial cloths neatly behind him. Because according to John chapter 2, he can neatly fold it there. Nobody stole the body. Oh, an imposter pretended to be a risen Jesus. Somebody came along and said, Hello, I'm Jesus! You think that, that this guy would fool the disciples? They were highly skeptical to start with him. But Jesus had the mark that was already written on the hand, the side, and one thing to see them. Jesus did a miracle by the Bible because of the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. That's the officials who have recognized oh, that's the Lord from the history. Jesus, the things that he taught in Acts chapter 1 about the coming kingdom, is the same as what he had taught to them before. There's angelic witness to the fact that Jesus is the one who has risen. When Jesus ascended, the angel understood that this is the one who will come again someday. And we see great change among the disciples. Because now they knew that the Lord had risen. They were scared at first, but now they have the confidence stand up for the faith and did so in the book of Acts. Stood up to those in the Sanhedrin, those priests in the temple that were going to be one priest and priest. They saw something. They didn't see an imposter. Saul of Tarsus saw Jesus. How do you explain the great change that's here you have one of the greatest enemies of Christianity? He saw a risen Lord. He saw the people's law. All these people are witness to the empty tomb. We have just seen and read about Mary and Peter and John. All these people, they carefully examined the tomb. The, the angel declared it empty. If the tomb was still containing the body of Jesus, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, that Jesus would have produced the body and then said, Look, what is the teaching wrong? That's here, his body. They couldn't do that. And so, this idea is wrong. There's only one reasonable possibility left, and that is, yes, he Last verse, Acts chapter 1. I want to go to Acts 1. Luke writes, I'll read verses 1 through 3. The former account I made of the office, of all that Jesus began to do, both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles and the children, in whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking the things presented to the kingdom of God. Luke says the proofs are infallible. They are unmistakable. They are there. He is risen. You, you can't say anything different from that because the other ideas are so absurd. He indeed is risen. And guess what? As he is Lord over us, as he is sitting at the right hand of the throne of heaven, he says that he's going to come again. He's coming again for judgment. Are you ready for that time? Are you ready? I could at this point and will not show that chart that we have seen throughout this series, the process of evidence. There's reason when you look at that evidence presented. Come to faith, and then we act on that. Through this evidence, we come to the conclusion that Jesus is indeed Lord. It's time to make him know that we have already. And if you've not been serving him as you should as a Christian, it's time to serve him as your Lord in all that you do in your life, in both your life to him, because the hope is real. At this time, be ready to answer the possible in the book. Come, I'll stand.